We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour, guten Morgen. I bring you greetings from uh, Katowice, Poland, where we've uh, converged for this year's uh, annual Internet Governance Forum. With me here are uh, a panel of distinguished persons where we're going to discuss uh, issues of control of uh, the internet in light with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So before we delve into uh, today's conversation, I want to let my, my panelists introduce themselves and their affiliations and how they're best qualified to uh, speak on this subject. Uh, over to you, Adisa. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to Katowice today. My name is Adisa Bulutiche, and I am the president of the Youth Observatory, which is the Internet Society's Youth Special Interest Group. And happy to be here today. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you've been listening to us. My name is Lily Edinambuche, also a part of the Directing Council for the Internet Society Special Interest Group, and I coordinate the Ghana Youth Internet Governance Forum. I'm excited to be part of this session and to share with you some of the learnings from our part of the world. Thank you. A good morning to you all. Uh, my name is Innocent Adrico, and I'm from uh, Uganda. Uh, part of Youth Observatory, of course, the Internet Society's uh, Special Interest Group on Youth. And uh, I also coordinate the Uganda Youth Internet Governance Forum. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And hi, everyone. And good morning from Poland. My name is Valerie Yega. I'm the Youth IGF Movement Ambassador for Kenya and also part of the Youth Observatory here. And just happy to see my colleagues and happy to be sharing our learnings from the topic that we're going to speak on today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie Akelo. I'm from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm part of the 2020 IGF Youth Ambassadors and also part of the Youth Sim team. I'm here to share my insights um, on the topic that we'll be discussing today. Looking forward to your insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Now, um, the advent of COVID came with uh, a number of challenges, many of which involved the locking down of uh, life the way we understood it. And with this lockdowns of life, the way we understood it came the need to morph or to adjust in the way we do life, basically go to work, study, and try to understand the things around us. Uh, I want to understand how uh, you, my panelists have adapted to this kind of change, what tools you have used and uh, what other mechanisms we can come up with to try and wed off the issues that come with uh, the drugs that have we, we now term as uh, uh, our online life. Uh, I, I would I want to start with uh, with Adisa. Has it uh, has it been easy for you to adapt to some of these tools? When did you eventually embrace some of these tools, and how have you made the most of them? Um, thank you very much, um, moderator. Uh, I think we all do agree that a lot has changed when um, it comes to the way we do things, the way we school, the way we shop, the way we move around. Especially as young people, um, our way of life has been affected, especially by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the internet, however, has been a saving grace for so many of us. We now can go to school online. We can attend meetings online. Um, we also have different um, daily living activities that has been translated 
um, to the internet now. So um, in the past couple of months or more than a year, actually, um, we have seen tools that have really helped in transitioning from a normal physical way of doing things to even a more digital way of doing things. Um, we now have um, online meeting platforms. We schedule meeting even with um, online tools and all of that. And also I see a lot of people are now more connected um, with social media, which also comes with its own challenges, but um, it's actually a gradual process. And even with these challenges, I, I'm, I, I believe that this is why we have discussions like this also, because we have challenges around inclusion. We have challenges around accessibility for people with disabilities and underrepresented groups. And also we um, have um, issues when it comes to policies and how um, it impacts young people who happen to be the largest demography of people who use the internet. So um, these discussions are very valid and important to address um, some of these issues, especially when it comes to inclusion, because the young people have been quite underrepresented for a while when it comes to internet policy and implementation. And this is why it's important that we represent our own perspectives in these discussions. And also we are able to understand um, where policy is coming from. Because sometimes we might actually be wrong. Sometimes we might not see it the way it should, but multi-stakeholder discussions like this give uh, um, a platform for us to actually engage and have a common ground um, when it comes to these issues. So the internet has been a blessing, like I said, um, Lots of people are developing more digital skills, even though um, the inclusion is not there yet. Certain parts of the world are still disconnected, um, which it's important that we connect the entire world so that more opportunities, there can be equal opportunities for people who live in say Africa um, compared to other places where um, there are more internet resources. So um, with this, I submit. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you so much, Adisa. I uh, wish to bounce the same question off to uh, Lily Bonisan as well. Right. So just to say that times have changed and um, in the advent of the pandemic, it didn't even get any better. It really got to the point where we um, had to, like you said, morph into being for digital citizens and to even explore more opportunities that exist on the online world. So this is what has happened. We have moved from balancing the offline and online world to seeing how we can even make the online world a natural extension of the offline. And what this means is that people are taking full course models online. People are working and submitting and, and meeting KPIs and meeting due dates and deadlines online to the extent that they don't even need any physical interaction or anybody's supervision. And people have even taken to autodidactism, which means self-learning, growing yourself, um, moving yourself from one field into the other because you've had tools online that are able to help you do so. Now, in getting to this point, there have been many explorations. Some people have started using tools and, and found out later on that they were not essentially um, very good at using those tools and had to ask people which ones work for them. I'll give an example. There are many conferencing tools that many people have used in the wake of the pandemic. And I'll give you um, Zoom, there's Webex, there is um, StreamYard and many others, right? People think that WebEx is really technical and to large extent because you have to um, get a link to join the meeting. And sometimes it feels as though like you are left out and somebody has to attend to you before you can come in. At the time, Zoom is really straightforward and you can go in and then uh, straightforward, somebody lets you in. You can raise your hand and ask a question and whatnot. Then when you come to the usage of the platforms itself, because you're talking about inclusive design, design designs for people who are adapting to the online space, I'm going to give um, some, some thoughts on even accessibility and how people use and maximize the usage of these tools. On Zoom, there has been the rise of captioning, closed captioning for people who essentially can hear clearly, but are able to follow through thoughts. There's also been interpretation that exists for people to be able to tap into um, 
languages that are probably not DS directly, but because they're interpreted, they're able to understand. And this is how this is this is made like possible because over the pandemic, people brought out their thought. People said we needed this um, addition. And even though it was there, they had to beef, up, beef, beef it up and have people to use it and say, okay, this works or this doesn't work. Now on WebEx, you may have the option of closed captioning, but not as right as you see a problem on Zoom, but this is like personal, I mean, uh, realization. But this is how people are able to relate to what works for them when it comes to accessibility and design and use of tools online. And I'm going to climax the submission right now with two things when it comes to the usage and how things have evolved for me in the, in the, in the wake of the pandemic. You would see that there are different personas and there are different pathways to adapting the tools that we use online. If you say persona, it's like Lily as somebody who is more um, auditory, she learns by say learning, and maybe say Valerie learns by say um, seeing. So she, she's more like of a visual learner. So we would want to appreciate tools differently. And um, so in a large extent, you have to find these tools that work for us and you're able to give our best while you're using it. And we're able to make it like help us in, our, in, in, in the usage of it. And then when it comes to the pathway, we want to know how does Lily find out that Zoom exists? Is it paid? Is it free? In my part of the world, do I have opportunities to use it without incurring so much, so much cost, especially because I'm a recent graduate? Do I have the, the necessary resources to be able to acquire them? All those are things that we bring into perspective when we are talking about design in the wake of the pandemic and how resources are evenly distributed so that young people can make the most of their usage online and essentially to live their dreams even as this pandemic is happening. And we all have the rare opportunity of gathering here and interacting with people online because of these technologies that we are using. But imagine if somebody sits in their room and they can't hear me because there's no interpretation or probably there's no closed captioning. And because of some special ability, they're not able to relate with me. You know, these are some of the things that have come up in the wake of the pandemic. And it's how I have um, probably evolved, I have evolved into the space because of the things that I've explored and able to use and why we are advocating that things could over, the, over time diversify to meet different personas and to appreciate or, or bring into perspective their, their parties into using technology. Thank you so much, uh, Lily. I would not have put it much better. In the same regard, I want to uh, call upon uh, Gabriel Kaysan, one of, our, one of our participants who is uh, remotely connected to to this chat, I want to ask him the same uh, question. How have you uh, been able to adapt in uh, the changing uh, times with, with COVID uh, on our laps? Jason, are you thank there? You. Yes, I'm here. I hope I'm audible. Yes, please proceed. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, Arthur. My name is Garson Gabriel. I'm the founder of the Emerging Youth Initiative and also affiliated with Youth Observatory and the Youth AGF. I mean, it's interesting, the topic you're discussing that I'm at the airport now and I'm actually using this online tools to connect to you and share my voice. And uh, adding up on what Lily said, it's one thing being connected and achieving meaningful connectivity. It's one thing having access to tools and actually being able to use these tools. Uh, the pandemic came with critical junctures that we were able to kind of fast track in terms of innovation, but this came at a uh, down point of polarization, which means that some societies have been able to go so fast. We see the metaverse, we see how emerging technologies are really taking shape and making advantages in how we interact with the world. But uh, we also see people who, young kids who did not get to school for like two years. Uh, it's, it's not because these tools are not there, but it's not ubiquitous to each and everybody. Uh, in, on earth. Uh, when we say we want a united internet, it means that we have to achieve inclusion and designing an inclusive space comes at a matter of design thinking. The first thing about design thinking is having empathy. Empathy to learn that there are different circumstances and parameters that come with different personas when they want to engage. So what are the parameters that we need to think about when it comes to having these tools? Because you can't access the tools when you don't have a connection. And how do you get a connection? As Adisa said, it's, it's important when we strengthen our institutions at a policy level, at also a cooperation and personal level, that we are able to understand key parameters and junctures to put the populations which have not been privileged enough to understand or to kind of like 
use the resources available for them because me as an African from Tanzania and my population, I cannot be equated with the Western kind of economy where it's easy for them to get access, to understand the level of digital literacy that goes with them, the affordability of the internet. And for me, which is very difficult just to go and get connected on a cellular level. So the tools like cloud computing, data-driven markets, uh, all the emerging, uh, the emerging skill sets and the emerging technologies which are available need to be ubiquitous to the culture of the people, which means that before we create parameters of setting tools, we need to understand what the people need, how the people can be engaged, and uh, how can they really achieve meaning and purpose when it goes to that. As we say now, uh, the virtual spaces have been an extension of people's lives, which means it is a life that you live online. It is the same person. I am the same person here on site uh, or online. So it's important for me to really have this close distinction between the line of accessing, understanding, and actually using it for the benefit of creating more development and, and understanding. And uh, with that, I'll close. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kaizen. Uh, Valerie, you seem to also connect strongly with the issue of uh, usage. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. I mean, when I was listening to Kaisen speak about the the challenges that are being faced in Tanzania and the question that you asked about how it has been adapting to the online space. Now, looking from my perspective as a trainee advocate who's currently at the Kenya School of Law and also having to learn virtually, then I'm able to relate a lot to what he's saying in terms of how the policies can actually match the culture and the kind of connectivity issues that we are facing. You see, for us now at the Kenya School of Law, what is happening is that the entire learning has been made virtual. And because of that, some of our colleagues maybe were with in the university are not able to now come onto the Kenya School of Law because now they've gone back home, the rural areas, there's no connectivity. So when also talking about designing inclusive spaces, we're also supposed to think about for you to get onto that platform for learning, how, are you able to connect to the platform of learning? And I think it's very important to think about that. On the cross side as well, I think just having those virtual spaces have, has also contributed positively in that people who could not actually get the resources to actually move to the place where the school is set up can now actually join online and achieve their dreams like what Lily was saying. So it's, it cuts both sides. So if we're able to take care of the disadvantages such as internet connectivity, the resources that are required, for instance, if you're using a platform that is a paid platform and how it can be subsidized, especially for young people to now access them, I see how the internet, as Bolu said, being an internet ble blessing is that it's very important because now we are getting more and more people engaging in terms of school, work and opportunities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. What are some of the skill sets that uh, we have been able, to, we have been forced to learn uh, to be effective um, online? I would appreciate or try to understand how, um, how uh, Innocent has uh, been pushed into the deep end and what skill sets he's been able to adapt uh, over time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, just before I talk about uh, what technologies have been able to adopt, uh, I'd like to bring a scenario. For example, uh, during the pandemic, we took some time in Uganda to do a survey for especially grassroots organizations just to understand the impact yeah, of uh, ad adopting these technologies. So uh, some of the results were impressive because uh, you'd see that actually grassroots organizations, some of them found it like so easy, yeah? Though of course with challenges, but um, of course there are also those that found it so hard. And one thing I noticed was that the organizations that found it so hard were actually organizations, for example, in rural areas. So that brought now the issue of uh, why. So finding about why we realized that uh, the biggest issue was connectivity, yeah? Uh, of course, with the challenges that the, the, the country was having and all that, yeah. These organizations, of course, uh, at, at that time couldn't work. The, the option was online. So coming to online again, you'd see that there are so many challenges. So looking at the personal perspective, 
Well, me, I would like to admit that uh, uh, it's not been hard for me because first of all, when you look at the challenges like issues of digital safety, I have been able to adopt because maybe I have some knowledge about it and what. What about the ones who don't have, yeah? Some of these platforms are not just safe, yeah? You need to know how to go, uh, go by when you're using them, yeah? And then uh, most of us, of course, uh, the challenge is now uh, we, we, we maybe lack the knowledge of which platform can be safe and which one cannot be safe, yeah? For us in the room here, I'm very sure we might have at least some knowledge to know that there are some platforms we shouldn't be on. Maybe if I'm using it and I'm on a public Wi-Fi, maybe I should put a VPN. But to a normal person, it won't work. So that then brings me to the issue of how do we help them know? Yeah. Well, at least I can say that um, uh, through capacity building, well, a lot can be achieved. Yeah. After that, uh, that research, we were able to start conducting uh, uh, countrywide digital security training. For, for these organizations and for individuals, yeah, to try and cover up the gap. So me personally, of course, uh, the challenges were not so much my side. Uh, my ad adaptability has been uh, uh, flexible because at least I knew how I can go around with it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, let me rephrase. How have you been effective? How have I been effective? All right, uh, I would say, have been very effective because first of all, uh, I've been working remotely, yeah? So of course, uh, one, uh, what I had to do was uh, get what platforms will work for me and uh, the, uh, be able to learn how they work. And then uh, of course, see how they, they, they help me do my work. So meaning uh, my work with them was made easier because I learned how to, how to use them and to apply them. So that increased my effectiveness using them for work, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Innocent. Uh, Ms. Jackie Akello, uh, how have you been effective? Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, so uh, the pandemic just made us realize how vital the internet is and how critical it is in every sector. So um, in the advent of um, the pandemic in March 2020, 2020 we realized that actually every sector needed the internet, that is education, health, um, agriculture, and even businesses. So I've been effective mostly um, using Wi-Fi. Um, in Kenya, we have the um, internet connectivity connected in every space, the office and the home. So it's Wi-Fi that I've been heavily relying on. But despite this, we realized that actually there's a big connectivity divide in the country. There are places that still lack the internet as we speak. So um, modern areas have the internet, but there's still some rural areas that lack the internet. And then another challenge that we realized during the pandemic is how expensive the internet is. It's actually not affordable for everyone. So these are critical things that actually need to be considered um, for reasons of bringing everyone online. Because actually as it is, not everyone is online. And right now the internet is very critical. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Jackie. Uh, speaking from the Ugandan perspective, we've, uh, we've lived through an interesting uh, two years. We've had a pandemic, then we've had elections in the pandemic. And uh, with this came, uh, came a number of things that involved uh, at some point switching off the internet. And yet we, we believe this is the only way we want to go forward. So uh, from, from our end, I think being effective has been very interesting, but I want to hear from the Ghana slash uh, US perspective, um, uh, Lily Bonison, how have you been able to uh, be effective over the last two years when life was online? Right. So um, it's, it's, it's been, we all know that tech is very fast evolving. So essentially we've had to unlearn and relearn a couple of things. Um, you would find that you're doing a lot of work online, but there are distractions, things that would probably take your time. So you're not able to balance properly or other times, like Innocent mentioned, the threats of security and you questioning your literacy of the internet. So you're digitally skilled, but are you digitally literate? Are you able to um, assess links and think through and, and see whether this is good or this is not good or whatnot? Um, how I've been effective using the internet um, as, 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 as me trying to, from time to time, refresh my memory, and especially when it comes to online tools, understand 
um, what tools are used for what particular purposes. Like I usually tell people that sometimes you find that you may be in, you may be using a tool and it's not probably yielding the result that it has to. So if you're using say, if you're using say a scheduler to schedule your meetings and you find out that you don't probably get alerts and you you don't get prompt and so you're missing meetings, you may want to that you may want to look to another thing to make it like work. And um, because I work probably in two time zones, Ghana and the US, I try as much to have time um, as scheduler that helps me meet prompts and it's able to help me meet due dates and deadlines so that I have work continuing. But there's a threat of security because most of us have been working from home. In, in offices, you have, say, the firewall configured for you. You have, say, updates um, automatically released from, say, your admin. And so things are automatically um, updated because there is, there is company policy to guide them. Even if you don't want them to, they'll probably just update on their own. But in your home, using your own machine, how are you able to think about it and see whether you're, you're, you're not just moving forward updates I mean, everybody sees all these updates that pop up on your, on your laptop and you reschedule it to the next three days. It gets to three days, you move it to another one because you don't want your machine to restart. All those got me thinking about how we're all actually security conscious using our own machines and getting our own systems up and running, especially because we are working with very important company details and even details that for ourselves, um, we want to keep private. So there I began exploring VPNs, even for my phone, for uh, my pieces and all that. But you want to even look at people who don't know about VPNs or people who probably um, are into exposed to all the security issues and to be able to detect what even um, a false link, a link that probably is as is, is, is a virus looks like, right? And how they're able to detect it and not click some things. And people who probably do not even know how to detect scams want to ask them, you want to um, inquire to know how they go around things like that. So for being effective, it's probably, it's been me having to relearn over time and um, just to just to be uh -huh. conscious most times. Yeah, so that has been how um, it's been going for me. And um, it's, still, it's still a long way to go if you ask me, more learning to be done. Oh, thank you so much, Lily. Uh, well, learning never stops. I, I, I want to uh, bring Kays and uh, Gabriel back uh, into the conversation in regards to uh, living through a pandemic and elections and how we have been able to be effective with the challenges that come with those two things I have already mentioned. Kaysan? Thank you, Arthur. Tanzania also had uh, elections during the pandemic, even though we did not uh, face some level of disclosure or closing of the internet as Uganda did, there was some form of censoring that happened or denied to access to some platforms. But the uh, funny thing is that you need people to vote. And so as for people to vote, you need them to be registered. The government has online systems to help facilitate this conversation. Uh, an open media as well, uh, media polarity where every candidate has the ability to use, especially social media to create their message. And we do believe that the internet in itself came at, as a parameter of decentralization, giving power to the people, more representative democracy. And the same government is the one that created some sort of junctures to prevent people from actually debating or open independent thinking when it comes to sharing their thoughts on uh, the electoral process. So this, uh, this, this, this is quite a challenge because you want people to be connected, you want people to be online, to engage, to have their voices out there. And at the same time, the governments and the systems they're creating are the ones that are trying to oppress the people. So we see that are the tools that we are creating or are the tools that we are trying to promote to society, uh, really helping the society in need of those tools. So. Uh, just to share a perspective, I think it's about time that we have crisis management and actually really open and decentralized systems of policy, as well as stronger institutions, which are not only reliable to one power or one authority in terms of creating a mandate of how the internet and uh, the tools should be, but rather how we can create it to be built from a bottom-up approach that cultivating a particular kind of generation, which, you, which you, I can say we represent that generation, to be critical and to be mindful in actually fighting for the digital rights in actually fighting for the digital spaces and actually creating some sort of a, of a, some sort of a digital space that's uh, quite 
reliable to each and every one. Because most of the African states, when they go through an election, we always find an issue with internet shutdowns. And uh, who do we go to report? And who is actually responsible? Because if you're a citizen, you are, you are part of the government. So what should, what, should, what should be done? It's important now to see together here how we can come with some sort of consensus or a recommendation, especially from a personal perspective level and how to translate this into policy as well as into multi-stakeholder institutions that can actually create a stronghold in creating safer spaces which are actually ubiquitous to each and everyone. Thank you all. Um, thank you so much, uh, Joshua. Uh, very interesting. You mentioned the multi-stakeholder uh, approach to, to managing some of the things. I had a conversation uh, earlier with uh, Innocent Adrico before the start of this session on taking on the multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, maybe something we could also share here and, and gather momentum in, some, in the same regard, uh, Innocent. All right, thank you very much once again, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, talking about the issue of uh, the multi-stakeholder approach, yeah, I'd like to say uh, to some extent, I feel like governments have felt like maybe it is their responsibility to see that we access the internet or not, because when you look, for example, at the Ugandan issue, it was more of like the government feels like we can do this and no one will do anything about it, which is not supposed to be the case. Then I was asking myself, why do they appear at the Internet Governance Forum? And what do they even say? Like, how do they even defend themselves here, for example? During 2019, I actually looked for government officials of Uganda in one of the sessions, and I asked them the same question, yeah? Because it's so unfortunate uh, that uh, a government would fail to know that when we shut down the internet, we are actually shutting down ourselves, yeah? Not only the people you feel maybe are opposition in your government, uh, are opposition to your government, but your economy, yeah? I was telling Arthur how uh, during the internet shutdown we had in Uganda, the city, for example, went so black. It was like, there's no activity in the city. So that is where you'd realize that actually the internet is something, it's everything almost, yeah? It's running how you live and it's running how your country can move on. So uh, talking about what can be done, yeah? Uh, I feel like maybe, for example, some governments uh, have really understood this. There's a time we had a chat with the government officials of uh, Switzerland, yeah? And uh, they seem to understand that actually it is great that the internet is there. And uh, I felt like, how can this be, uh, uh, shared to the other governments, for example. Maybe multilateralism can play a role in that, yeah? Maybe diplomacy can play a role in that. We need maybe to step out and be like, you know what? Let the issue of the internet come on global uh, talks, yeah? For example, now like how they, uh, they have very serious discussions about the climate change and all that. Maybe let it come on ground. Maybe that is how maybe we are going to be able to lobby uh, well, that's maybe how we're going to lobby for some of these things to change. Because I don't want us to reach at a time uh, when uh, the internet will become uh, a challenge again, the way we've, we, we, we've had the climate issue now. It's so terrible that everyone is now panicking. Yet sometime back, we had a choice. We had a, a decision to make, yeah? So maybe we need to step out and see that we address the issues of uh, digitalization, when it is early, when we have the time, let every government come out and be able to understand what needs to be done or what doesn't need to be done. And maybe that way we can have countries help each other. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Innocent, uh, for, for the wonderful insights. Uh, Valerie, you seem to be nodding. Uh, you're the legal brain in the room. Is this something we should explore? Um, thank you so much, moderator. As Innocent was speaking, I think for me, my life mantra has always been three things, the three E's. That's education, exposure, and experience. And I also wonder so much about what Innocent is talking about in terms of how governments have taken up the issue of multi-stakeholder approach, especially when it's about the internet. And this year's theme is the internet united. And just 
across the year, these two years when we've had the pandemic, I'm very fortunate to work for a farm where it's very powered in terms of internet and in terms of data security because a lot of them has many confidential matters. But I always wonder about my peers in terms of, you see, right now when we're working with the internet, the thing when Lily spoke about security updates that you get on your laptop. So because of where I work, I'm able to understand that because of the numerous trainings that we are taken through because of data security. I wonder about someone who's like me, studying like me, but they're not able to understand what it means to have data security. They're not able to understand the opportunities that you get on the internet in terms of how you're open to learning, open to using some of these tools to access the internet. And I think it also comes to a situation where you asked, what are the skills that made us effective? And I think one of the main skills that I picked up is that you need to be extremely flexible and open to learning. Because like Lily said, there's a lot that's changing with the internet. The technology is very fast. Today, there are so many trainings that are being done. I think because of where I work, because of the, a lot of the software that we move around, you have to stay learning. Today, there's a new software to keep the documents. Tomorrow, there's a new software to keep um, signatures and, and contracts and things like that. So I think my worry is that if we do not make this conversation as serious as it is, we may end up having the crisis that Ino is talking about where he's saying that we may end up 10 years from now, there's such a big distinction among the young people, especially from, since I come from Kenya. So I'm more, I look a lot about the African youth and how we're going to have that huge gap if nothing is done in terms of the training and the learning and the kind of people, the kind of young people we'll have 10 years from now. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, I, I, I want to move this on to uh, Lily. Uh, apart from the role that governments play in fostering uh, the, the, the movement of the internet, what alliances can we build with the private sector, for instance, and civil society to consolidate a united internet? Right. So we, um, I, I like the fact, I like the conversation about alliances and partnership. And it's what cements the multi stakeholder approach to engagement. Um, and it's important because you may go further on in the in a deliberation, in a strategy for inclusion and realize that you've left a stakeholder group out and would have to retrace when your plans are really far advanced. And that's why it's important that at the beginning of your, your, your strategy, your planning, even the user, the community are seeking to serve, the citizens are not even left out. For all you know, you may be designing things for them that probably do not work essentially because of probably where they are positioned, their geographical location, their needs, and very unique things that when you dialogue with them, you can be able to find out. When it comes to partnership, especially with private organizations, um, we are currently running a research on digital inclusion for a community in the US. And a part where I've seen private sector play a very active role is when it comes to hardware redistribution, hardware clinics, and hardware um, and, and accessibility when it comes to devices and device usage. In the, in the questing about connecting people and infrastructure with regards to the internet. The first thing that you want to look at is a hardware tool, what infrastructure is available um, to, to be able to connect them and how essentially they have the literacy and the skills to connect to such conversation. So for alliances and partnerships, we want to look at what devices people have, essentially the opportunity for you to redistribute when necessary or partnerships to make available these tools for usage. And um, that's like the very first leg into getting people to use and getting people connected in the internet space. And um, with infrastructure, very, um, studies have shown that the structural barriers, barriers to um, fully using and meaningfully participating in the, online, in the online world. And here also private institutions are liaison with government and other stakeholder groups to be able to provide help, not only um, for the devices, like I mentioned earlier on, but for, but for learning also, and also for when it comes to the security awareness creation and capacity building. And a very interesting point of the conversation about alliances with private institutions that is cropping up is employment. Now, everybody talks about technology and its usage. But there is a part that advances technology from just usage to where it economically empowers. And when it's economically empowering, it means that people are able to secure jobs, growing jobs, and also contribute to society because there are skills that are being built and innovation that are cropping up. 
So how these private institutions are helping are to um, run people through things like accelerator programs, run them through um, skills uh, clinics, and to build capacities and probably um, employ them into mainstream or sometimes even start something with them in the community. And um, in that light, if you're trying to um, maybe shape the internet, you are getting community champions who understand the needs of the community. You're getting citizens who understand the needs of the of the of the of the um, the jurisdiction where they live in, and, and they're able to probably grow and use it because they they they've been able to they know they have first-hand information and now have skills to be able to um, contribute meaningfully. So these are the places where partnerships can exist. That is ranging from um, hardware provision, redistribution, security, um, um, awareness creation, and, and capability building, and then through to employment and job creation because technology essentially can empower. And that is how far reaching the internet has gone. And that is why we advocate for its, safe, its, its continuous availability and openness. We need to make our governments to start uh, being, uh, uh, to some extent, of course, it's very hard to, to make a government to, to do what, what exactly you want, but we need to face these people, yeah? I know there are sessions that are going to involve government here. What about we take, our issues here to their session so that we can hear from them what they have to say, yeah? Uh, maybe uh, also back there, of course, they talked about how we need to engage them back there. Like we have uh, regional initiatives, yeah? We have uh, the East African IGFs, we have the national IGFs, yeah? We need to engage these policymakers. We need government people to come around. And if there's anything really they feel like is an issue, maybe they can be able to tell us because otherwise we are going to be left behind uh, because uh, the government we have maybe is not willing to do what exactly others are doing. Yeah. So uh, mine is that uh, we look back there. Yeah. What is the role of government, which is supposed to actually be the key player in this? Yeah. Uh, so. It's open to us today. We have a whole week here. We need to make our leaders accountable. They need to tell us. So we are. We need to face them. Yeah. Some already talked of uh, going to the mic. We have so many issues we've talked about here. So we need to take them out there because the people we want to talk to are not inside here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, moderator. And I think. Um... A lot has been said uh, by the previous speakers on what the young people need to do. But for me, I always look at it this way. Um, bring to the table what you have and bring who you are. So this is what it, it means basically is that everyone can contribute to the theme of having the internet united, depending on who you are. Like Lily said, not all of us could come for speaking engagements, but bring who you are. Are you a researcher in the university? Are you doing research around what's happening with the internet? We need to read about that. We need to see what actions are being done. I'll give you a good example. And I think uh, Shadrach was in on this earlier on in the year when Afrinik was facing a challenge where there was a problem with the internet infrastructure wanting to be moved out of Africa into the West. But I remember just seeing many young people signing out their names so that they could be able to have the government where the court case was happening to listen to the appeal to just have the internet infrastructure remain in Africa. But my question was, as young people, do we understand how this is our business? Because if the internet infrastructure that's meant for Africa is moved into different countries or different continents, that means more and more African people are not going to be connected. So my, my plea would be to bring who you are, whether you're a researcher, whether you're a speaker, whether it's art, whether it's music, bring who you are. And again, I always say this because being a, an alumni of digital grassroots, I think, we need to see more young people coming through for more young people. As I sit here, I sit with my senior Bolutife because of the training that he gave me, I'm able to now know which niche of the internet I'd like to be in, which niche I'd, I'd like to contribute in. So I also think having that space where young people are there for each other and being able to learn how we can contribute to the internet is very important. So for me, I'd like to say, bring who you are, bring any experience that you have, you serve a greater purpose in this fight to get the, an internet united. Thank you. 
Um, thank you so much for that, moderator. Um, I tend to agree a lot with Lily. I think to address the um, issues around the internet, we need to go to the root of the problem. And we start by research, that is researching which rights are being impacted, how these rights can be protected on the internet space. Another thing we need to, we need to do from moving away from the layer of research, we need now to move to the advocacy level. We can advocate on the various platforms we have. Um, young people are very active on social media platforms. We can and make our voice heard um, on the social media platform, reaching out to the leaders and addressing these issues. Okay, to bring more people on board, we also need to enlighten the other youths in the society on their rights on the internet and the freedoms they have on the internet. By enlightening them, we'll be bringing more voices uh, we'll be making our voices heard by the government. Another thing we need to do as young people, which I don't see most of us doing, is participation in, uh, in policy making processes. We can participate in the drafting of bills and even when these bills are being presented in, in government. By doing that, we'll be making our voices heard and we'll be making the government consider many things that they, that they overlook when it comes to the internet. So that's how I think we can also make our voices heard. Uh, thank you. Um, I wish to call upon uh, Kaysan, who's joining us online, to also submit. Yes, uh, it's true. I do agree with a lot that has been said from my peers. And uh, in the end, summing it up, it goes to character. When we say bring who you are in leadership, a leader, leadership begins with you. You need to build yourself in terms who you are as an individual, because as an individual, there's a part that should that leaders to cultivate on our character with all the principles and the values of the social norms that are important to create a more inclusive space. And uh, most of us has, have been beneficiaries of these fellowships. Uh, I was a fellow, I saw fellow from 2018. And from there, I kept building on my voice till now. We are part of the table trying to create uh, the next phase of how we build internet leadership. But this came at the part where I fundamentally had to understand my niche. I had to understand myself as a person and build on that character and the characteristic knowing that to be a significant member of a connected community comes with an obligation that I have to sustain so that we can achieve this form of sustainability. There are levels where we have, at an individual level, you can speak to your peers like how we're doing here, most of us are friends here, yeah, even arranging the session came from us knowing each other personally, not, not, not because we were uh, avid uh, corporate or employees of some in, uh, organizations. It came because we as people were passionate about the internet and we could see our part in it. So we could work on that, that is important. And then it gets caged into leadership. It's important when we understand what brand of leadership are we really trying to do. We understand our distinct part in how we build all that we need to build. Another thing is that from there, when we have enough skill sets, it's, it's important to cultivate or to refine a message which can be pushed into a policy level because inclusive policy as well needs some form of structures. So it's important if we could actually share our understanding, our best practices, and uh, most importantly, be open up to dialogue and conversations with a niche of understanding uh, our part uh, on the internet. And uh, open data, open sharing, as well as always being able to take and cultivate and build voice with, without uh, any fear or without uh, any oppressions, it will be important. As young people here, we have champions. We have champions who look at us. We have people from different areas who see us and see some sort of representation and that comes with the responsibility and it's about time that we work on that and do more. Uh, thank you so much Kaysan. Do, do we have any questions from, from the audience? Thank you very much I mean for sharing these ideas with us. Uh, my question is how can we like help young people to set up I mean initiatives in their respective countries especially I'm going back to talk about inaccessibility because we still have like we still are facing this inaccessibility when it comes to talk about like access to internet. And especially uh, in Central Africa, we are like not more connected. In chat, for instance, I'm talking about like how youth want to be more involved, but what kind of problems are they facing? 
and how can we help them like to be, to be like more engaged and what like kind of things they can contribute to promote like, uh, I mean, a safe access to internet. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, any other questions? We would like to take all of them or if uh, that's not the case, I could ask uh, any, any of the panelists here, the internet, so what? We, we, we in Africa have considerably bigger problems to worry about, especially among the youth. So the internet, so what? Uh, it's open to any of our panelists. I want to touch on um, um, Itaka's question. I'll touch on yours briefly, just very briefly. So we have the other panel members also step in. So Isaka's question was, how do we help young people to set up initiatives in their home countries and what support is available? And essentially what can young people add um, to the advocacy we have based on the initiatives we set up. So um, I find out that usually when you have, say, initiatives that start from the grassroots, it means that they are able to understand what is happening on the ground. And then they have some support, home support, because they all feel what they feel from where it affects them the most. And if you wanted to start up something in your community, I think essentially because you want to impact not just you, you may want to see um, how people are in support of what you want to do. Maybe talk to people who are locally um, leaders and, and, and probably would help you on your journey and then connect to the global or larger group. Let's just talk about NRIs, which is a national and regional initiatives for the IGF. If you want to start up an IGF because you want to avoid any conflicting initiatives um, that exist, that which are essentially NRIs recognized by the IGF, you want to look around you and ask, are there any existing ones? And then you probably make your, uh, if there are none, you make your ideas known and then you can take it from there. What you do is to probably get people who support you, a team. You can't run it on your own. And because the IGF is multi-stakeholder, they usually ask you to have as diverse, a, a team as diverse as possible with skills, with representation, and also from the stakeholder groups. Is it the technical community? Is it government? Is it um, just an end user or somebody interested in making your work very fruitful? And then because there are resources that have been amassed globally for you to be able to tap into like funds, like expertise, like learning materials, you want to connect to the global IGF so that you can get um, some benefits like this. And um, I'm just, I'd like to thank Meada for actually coming in and enlightening us and on what's happening on the ground in Sudan. And I think we'll talk more about that. Um, so for the tool that got me through the pandemic, quite a number actually, because <laughs> I think for me, it has to be the meeting, the tool that I used for meeting, especially because I'm in work, I'm doing school as well. So this, the meeting tools, um, yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mayada here for bringing out the issue. I was almost saying something about that, but unfortunately, our time is out. Uh, but uh, maybe just to say that, uh, uh, as I already said, uh, maybe these uh, multinational engagements can be a solution to that. For example, in the UN, there's a, a rapporteur, I think, on uh, information and digital rights something. Yeah, those could be options to explore, even in the AU. There are those specific sections of the AU that handle such kind of issues. Then the regional organizations, yeah? So maybe those are options to explore, but that's a discussion of another day. Uh, talking about platforms that uh, help me go through the, the pandemic meeting platform, definitely, and especially Zoom. O almost everything was on Zoom for me. Yeah, thank you. Mine was Zoom, that's about it. Yeah, um, I won't take time, but I think um, the platforms are multidimensional. So I would say it was more or less the ability to learn on the go that really helped because there were lots of platforms that really helped. Um, I want to thank you all for being such a great uh, panel. I want to thank the audience as well for the great insights that they have uh, brought to this conversation. I have been Arthur Oyako, your moderator for this uh, session, and I want to wish you all a pleasant day ahead.